love you, and we ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit, speak to us through your words this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Why don't we have a seat? All right. Well, this morning we are starting things off. Um, I'm excited for this. We get to dedicate a baby this morning, a child, to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Um, for those of you who maybe this is your first time here or you, you haven't been a part of this before, um, a child dedication is, is not something that ensures salvation. We are not saying, uh, thus, because we are doing this, this child is saved. Um, what we're doing is we are blessing and we are asking the Lord that he would lead this child into a second birth, into being born again at a time when they're able to make that decision for themselves. And so um, we're asking, Lord, would you bring them to a place where they would open themselves and entrust their lives to you to come into their life and to be their savior, their king, and their friend. And so a child dedication is a commitment on uh, part of the parents that they are going to pray for their child. They are going to raise their child to know the Lord, to have a personal relationship with him. They, they can't make that happen, but they're going to endeavor towards that end. And uh, they're going to commit to faithfully raise their son or daughter to know the Lord and be involved within the church family as well. And so it also then beca becomes a commitment on us as the church family as well, uh, that we are going to encourage and support and serve the parents toward that end. So I'm going to invite Clay and Kate and Senna Murray up here. We're going to dedicate little Senna this morning. Um, if you don't know Clay and Kate, uh, if you haven't met them before, they've been a part of our congregation for a couple of years now, and you guys are, are well entrenched in the youth and uh, young adults community here, and um, you guys are just such a, a blessing to our church family, and we're so thankful for you. Thankful for Senna as well, and uh, just the joy that she is um, you look fantastic this morning, little girly, and uh, we're excited to, to have you here. Um, Clay and Kate, uh, I'm just going to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, and 7. And this is speaking to our responsibilities as parents, as fathers and as mothers. Uh, this is what the Lord had told people of Israel back then. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Clay and Kate, throughout your days with Senna, as you walk together and talk together and eat together and do life together with her over these coming years. Uh, teach her about the faithfulness and goodness of God. May that be at the forefront of your, um, you know, there's all, we can talk about parenting and all the different ways in which we need to go about that, but may at the heart of everything you do be that you are pointing her to the faithfulness and the goodness of God. More than that, though, as well, be willing to open up and share with her your experience of God in your lives. May she see a mother and a father who are so in love with Jesus, so um, surrendered to the Holy Spirit in your lives as individuals and as a family, that she sees worshipers, she sees you praying, she sees you in the word, she sees you serving and loving others as you endeavor to follow Jesus. Um, and as you pursue him above all else. You know, our, our, our words are important, but our example speaks even louder. And so speak to her about Christ, but also show her that. I'm going to read some vows of dedication uh, for you. And if you're in agreement, and I'm assuming because you, you, you asked to be here, you wanted to be here, that you are going to say yes at the end of, of each statement. Um, Clay and Kate, in presenting your precious daughter, Senna, to the Lord, you are entering into a solemn relationship with the God who keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. And we want to, I want to affirm that this is a noble and wonderful godly desire. 
believing that Senna is a gift from God and that he is going to hold you accountable for how she is raised and how you point her to Christ, do you confess that it is your purpose and desire to dedicate Senna to the Lord this morning? Will you pray with Senna? Will you pray for Senna, instructing her faithfully in the truth and doctrines of the faith and teaching her to know God's word, to pray and to know or to live a holy life? Thanks. Will you commit to faithfully include her in the life of the church, both in its worship and its community, as best as you are able? Will you seek to do all that is possible to bring Senna to a knowledge of Jesus as her Lord and Savior? Wonderful. All right, well, now it's our turn as a church family. And I'm going to ask if there's any uh, elders that are here present. I just want to invite you to come forward here with me. And if you're able to, to lay hands on the family, on Senna. And church family, I want to invite you to stand. I know we've done a lot of sit, stand, sit, stand. But I want to invite you to stand and and to extend a hand towards, towards them, towards Clay and Kate, towards Senna. And we're going to pray for you that we're going to bless you, we're going to commission you uh, for the great task that you have before you. It is, some, it is daunting, but it is not impossible. The Lord goes with you, and he delights to see you as a family thrive and to see Senna come to faith at a given point in time to come. So Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the precious gift that Senna is, both to Clay and to Kate, to our family here, church family, to their extended family, to this community. Lord, we thank you for her story. Lord, thank you for the story that you have for her in the years to come, the story that you are going to write in her life. Lord, we join with Clay and Kate. We join with their desire to see Senna receive you for who you are. We desire to see her to know you intimately, to love you wholeheartedly, and to follow you wherever it is that you are going to lead her. Jesus, may your love capture her heart from a young age, and may she know and experience your Holy Spirit throughout her life as she walks with you. Holy Spirit, we ask for your protection and for your blessing over her. We pray for her parents, that you would bless Kate that you would bless Clay with an abundant love and patience and wisdom as they raise Senna to become a woman who knows and loves you. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. I'm going to give this to you as well. Thank you for your welcome here. Yeah. Let's give him a hand here. We love you guys. I'm so excited for you. And Senna, you're awesome. Um, I, believe, I believe that the Lord has something for us this morning. I believe the Lord has something for you this morning. He has something for us this morning. And the reason I say that is not because I think what I'm going to say is, is going to be um, profound or insightful or incredibly intelligent or anything like that, but because we're opening the words of Jesus, and that his spirit is going to illuminate that for us and is going to, to speak to our hearts and to our minds this morning. And, uh, and I, I believe he has something for us. So I invite you to just open up to Hebrews chapter 9 right now. If you uh, are using one of the blue Bibles on a seat around you, I believe it's on page 1037, 38, something like that. I'll give you a second to turn there. Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to read through the whole chapter. I'm not going to, we're, we're going to go through it this morning. Um, we're going to focus on a few spaces more than others. But I want to read through the entirety of this chapter just to give us um, just a bit of a sense of what we're getting into here. So Hebrews chapter 9 says this. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. 
Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. I love that line. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry out their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and very ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect until the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to the people, he took the blood of the calves together with the, wa- the water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law required that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then, for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord for us today. We're going to dive in here. Um, I don't want to presume that we can adequately cover absolutely everything in this. We'd be here a long time. Um, but I encourage you to meditate on this this week and to just be open this morning to what the Lord has for you. Question for you this morning. Have you ever seen something? Have you ever seen something that, although perhaps horrific, you have a hard time looking away. You are as if drawn into what is happening. Our text this morning starts talking about something without actually delving into the details of the thing. I I know you're looking at this thinking, man, that actually seemed pretty detailed, but what the author of Hebrews has been doing the last couple chapters and what he's doing in chapter 9 is he's trying to summarize, encapsulate a sacrificial system, an old covenant, an old order, an old way of doing things that for us today is so foreign, it is so alien, it is so strange for us to even consider what actually took place. You know, the the original hearers of this, this sermon that Hebrews is, 
were well aware of the old sacrificial system. He didn't have to go into as many details as we might have to in study to, to actually understand these things. Another thing that they were well aware of, well acquainted with, that they would have seen with their eyes or at the very least would have heard about with their ears from eyewitnesses is the horrific spectacle that crucifixion was and the brutality that it entailed for the victim. And I'm not going to go into detail about that this morning, but I just want that to be aware. They would have been very aware of what that looked like, what that sounded like. Crucifixion was not something that you would talk about in polite company. It was something that would make you shudder at the very thought of. It was a, a shameful end, to put it mild, mildly. And yet when we, what we see in the Gospels are people standing around the crucified Christ in awe of him. Now, in chapter 9 here, we've, what we just read here, what the author is doing is, is jumping right in. The first few verses here, you saw this, you heard this, is listing um, some of the items and the furnishings of this building called the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? Well, the word for tabernacle in Hebrew, mishkan, was simply just to be a dwelling place. It was a tent. Okay? It's where our English word tabernacle comes from, is from the Latin word for tent. But this, is, this wasn't just any ordinary tent. This wasn't a, you go on a camping trip and set up your tent kind of thing. The tabernacle was a place of meeting. It was a place of encounter. It was a place of presence, where God's presence dwelt on earth. It's where his people could come to meet with him. And the scriptures first introduce us to this tent in Exodus 25. And the way that even you see some of this in Hebrews 9 here, talking about the, the gold covered this and the gold covered that, this was a space that was intentionally made beautiful. There was a beauty in the inner parts of this tent as you progress through different veils to get back to where the most holy of holies was. There was a space prepared. There was a space kept ready to receive the presence of God. Now, the exterior was a relatively unadorned, heavy, curtain-like material, but the interior was purposefully designed and decorated to point to another reality. And that's one of the things that beauty can do for us, is it points us to another reality. Artist Mako Fujimura points to us and reminds us that beauty feeds our souls. But the problem with the beauty of the tabernacle, the problem is that to get to this beauty and to get to the presence within requires us to deal with something that is not so beautiful. It requires us to deal with blood. And this tent was the location, the place, it was the beating heart of this sacrificial system that Hebrews has been talking about. A sacrificial system that necessitated blood and assumed death. Verse 7 tells us here in Hebrews 9, it says, The high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year he would do this, and he never did it without blood. It, it's talking about this once-a-year event called the Day of Atonement. And if you want to dive deeper into that, you can look at Leviticus 16 to see more in detail. But what sacrifice did here was it made it possible for this high priest to then enter into the furthest reaches of that tent, into the presence of God. Beauty was preceded by blood. Presence was preceded by pain. Dwelling was preceded by death. And I don't, I don't think that we, we truly understand. I don't think we can really comprehend what this would have been like. The, the sounds, the sights, the smells, the assault on our senses. And as I was thinking about this this week, the word that kept coming to mind, and I'm going to explain a little bit why I want to use it, the word I'm choosing here to describe some of what was going on among the many words we could choose is the word grotesque. You might think that an odd word to use or maybe inappropriate to use. But something that is grotesque is, is something that is not only out there and, and, and perhaps 
unappealing or, 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 or uh, bizarre or absurd. It is fantastically so. And I think for us in the 21st century, we would agree that we look at a sacrificial system like this and we think, wow, this is just outside of anything that we have really ever experienced. Merriam-Webster's dictionary describes the word grotesque in these ways as being disagreeable to one's aesthetic or artistic sense, unpleasant to look at, monstrous, frightening. It is the opposite of that which is beautiful and lovely and attractive. And when it comes to the animals, you know, unless you are a cattle rancher or a hunter, I mean, we, we don't have a sense of what it actually means to engage with animals in this way. We are so insulated from that. We have a very sanitized experience. But to imagine that depending on the day, hundreds if not thousands of animals, blood pooling on the ground, running like streams, the sounds, the sights, the smell would have been overwhelming. It was strange for us. It would be strange for us. It would be an alien world for us in the 21st century. I don't think grotesque is too strong a word to describe that. It was necessary, but it wasn't beautiful. It's unpleasant to look at, to hear, to smell, to think about. Which, by the way, is part of the point. Because what it is trying to deal with is trying to tell us that this is where sin leads us. Sin leads to death. These are the sights, these are the sounds, these are the smells that sin leads to. It leads to the grotesque. The system that God put in place for them, that he invited them into, it, it wasn't pointless or purposeless. It wasn't even futile. It was what he had given them. It was at that moment in time, it was the grace that he had given them to engage in a relationship with him. I think it's important for us to acknowledge when something in the Bible jars us in these ways. Um, some of us, you might, you might think, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've read this or I've read in other places in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. I've read these kinds of these passages before, and yeah, that's about right. That sounds like what they did. But if you just stop and pause for a moment and actually just allow it to hit you and to realize this, this is so strange and alien to us. This is so outside of our experience. It doesn't mean that we avoid those things. It doesn't mean that we skip around them or that we reword them or that we change them or reimagine them or sanitize them, but we uh, humbly allow these things to confront us, to challenge us, and to surprise us and to see what is it that God has in store for us through this. Blood preceded beauty. And the Old Covenant sacrificial system wouldn't be the last time that we see beauty and the grotesque side by side. You know, in chapter 9 here, verse 20, I'm skipping ahead here for just a little bit, but verse 20 has this line that is quoting right from Exodus 24, 8, in the context of the Day of Atonement. And Moses is, is telling the people, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Now Hebrews uses this line and uses it in reference to Jesus. In the crucifixion of Jesus, a new covenant is brokered, and it is brokered by the faithful one, the most faithful one, who solidifies this agreement and keeps it to the utmost to the point of shedding his own blood to make it happen. And so what we see in Hebrews, right, front, right as we've been going through it, is that Jesus is not only a priest, he is the high priest, but he is not only the high priest that brings a sacrifice, he is the sacrifice himself. He presents himself to the Father as the one who gave himself for us. You're God's people, then. Move from an unending series of annual days of atonement, year after year after year, and what we get to do now, in light of what Jesus has done on the cross, is we look at the cross and we say, that was the day of atonement. That was the one day of atonement. And there will be no other day after that. You see, the cross is the literal crux 
of the biblical story, the main feature, the center that holds it all together. Everything that leads up to it, leads up, or that comes before it, leads up to that point, and everything that comes after it flows from that event. The cross is the place where the love of God meets the worst that sin and evil and death have to offer. And it transfigures it, it transforms it into something that no one could have expected. And in this way, we see the blending of the, the, the grotesque and the beautiful and the power of God at work to bring about something that was unexpected. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about how the cross doesn't make sense to some. He talks about how it's a, a stumbling block to the Jews and, and how it is foolishness to the Gentiles. It's this, this absurdity to others. Another word that he uses to describe the cross is scandal. But he also says, he ultimately says that to those being saved, it, the cross, is the power of God. So how does a symbol of abhorrent violence become the symbol of victorious power? This is where the cross is both disturbing and alluring. It is strange and alien, but it is the place where we are brought home. It is repulsive, it is horrifying, but it is nonetheless captivating. Revelation 19 tells us that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Lamb who is slain before the foundation of the world. Everything that was happening in that old sacrificial system, everything that was happening in all those years previous was leading up to this point. It was pointing towards the time when God would come himself and deal with sin, death, and evil once and for all. And over the centuries, countless artists have attempted to capture this reality. I've got one such picture here for us this morning. This one is by Nikolaus Hagenauer and Matthias Grunwald, painted in 1516 to be an altarpiece in a town called Eisenheim or Isenheim in northeastern France. You know, the cross, it's so interesting. We wear the cross as a, as, a, as a beautiful pendant on a necklace sometimes. You'll see it in paintings or maybe someone gets a tattoo in their arm or something like that. It's, it's something that we, we view at with, with beauty in a lot of ways. But the cross of Jesus had nothing beautiful about it. You know, it's, it's at this time, in, you know, after, of course, after Christ, it became the symbol of our faith, but it was the most irreligious symbol you could think of at the time. This is the center of our faith. This is where it all comes down to. An innocent man, God in flesh, broken for you and me. And it captures us. It draws us in. It is so utterly horrific, and yet it is so difficult to look away. Jesus' self-giving sacrifice is better than anything that came before, and it's better than anything that you and I could offer to God. I want you to take a look with me here in verse 8 in our text. It says this, The Holy Spirit was showing by this, and by this, what it means is the tabernacle, the arrangement of instruments and ornamentation, the, the regular attendance of the priests, the annual sacrifice, all of it. The Holy Spirit was showing by this, that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. By first tabernacle, by the way, it's not meaning that the very first original tent that Israel carried around in the wilderness and set up when it made camp. The first tent is just simply another way of talking about the first covenant, talking about the first order of doing things. What's going on here? Well, if we go into verse 9 and 10, it gives us a bit more direction here. It says, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and very ceremonial washings, external regulations applying to a time of the new order. Hebrews is telling us that this way of relating to God 
and approaching God through the tabernacle, through the sacrifices, through the priesthood. It was limited in its scope and in its effectiveness. It was, wasn't useless, but it wasn't final. It wasn't the purpose that God had intended to be the last word. I thought it was funny uh, last week, Anthony, I don't know if you're in the room here, but I thought it was quite funny as you were sharing about the number of fridges you guys had to go through in years past. How you'd buy a fridge and then you'd break down that year, you have to buy another fridge and it'll break down. Because I had written down an illustration that was actually very similar to that, and I had to scratch that off because, well, you kind of stole it from me. So it, um, <laughs> but I was thinking about, you know, how, you know, you know, appliances that we purchase these days. I mean, how many of you have had fridges or washing machines before that either you bought original 20, 30 years ago, or you bought the house and it's original to the house, right? And those things are beaters and they just go, go, go. They last forever. But the new things are designed to break down. They're designed intentionally to not last that long because they want you to buy another one. And I was thinking about another example that we've likely all experienced in some way or another, and how frustrating it is to realize that same thing with, say, your phone, for example, right? How frustrating is it to realize that you've paid sometimes upwards of hundreds of dollars for this thing, and it's purposely designed to go out of date within six months to a year. A new model comes out, and then new operating systems and updates come out, and new apps come out. And if you're like me, and you purposely are okay buying the oldest model when you, when you get a phone and you think, okay, I'm going to make this thing last as long as I can, there comes a certain point in time when your phone can't handle the operating system that it's being called to use. And there's apps you can't use with that phone. Maybe I'm not the, maybe I'm the only one, I don't know. But when I think about the way that Christ came and the new order of things that he brought into play, the new covenant that he brought, that he established through the cross, I think about how the operating system of the old covenant was made obsolete in that moment. The new, the better, the final, the infinitely newer and better had come. You see, the laws and the sacrifices in the Old Testament weren't the end game, they weren't the end goal, they weren't even the best way to approach God. God had purposely designed the old way of doing things to be ineffective so that it would lead us to the cross. Our text tells us that the old way wasn't even able to clear the consciences of the worshipers. It couldn't even do the inner heart work necessary to purify us before a holy God. It dealt with sin from the past year, but it couldn't change. It couldn't transform the person who's offering that sacrifice. In Greek, the word to clear is, is the same as the word to perfect, as in to reach its intended purpose. But it can also have the metaphorical meaning of to cleanse. And one of the purposes of Jesus' sacrifice was to bring your conscience and to bring my conscience into an experience of perfection to where we are clear and clean before God. Oh, isn't that good news? The old covenant, the old ways were not bad. It's just that they are now obsolete in light of the cross. There's no point in going back. The new operating system that Jesus put in place, it's infinitely too powerful to even, it, the old way doesn't even make sense to go back to that because Jesus' sacrifice is better. Look at verse 11 with me here. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater, the more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place. That is, he entered into the presence of God himself once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. And verse 13 continues on. He says, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them. It, it purifies and makes them clean so they are outwardly clean. And I love this. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? 
on the Day of Atonement, which I mentioned you can look at in Leviticus 16 in more detail, blood from the sacrifice would be sprinkled upon the people and upon the instruments within the tabernacle, the furnishings, the, the ornamentation. And he talks about that a little bit in verses 16 to 19, but when you come down to verse 22, it says that it was necessary that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Again, the point here is not that the Old Covenant was useless, but it was insufficient for the problem at hand. It was never meant to fix the problem. And even the items that they used within their ceremonies had to be cleansed from, uh, to be cleansed by the blood. Yet with Christ, what do we see down here? Verses 24 to 26 here. We get down to, let me see here. Down to verse 26. It talks about Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. How much more then? Jesus did away with sin. Once and for all. Yeah, but Jonathan, you just don't understand. You, you, don't, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm wrestling with. You don't know how much more then? How much more then? Yes, but do you know how much more then? Jesus has dealt with sin in such an extensive complete, comprehensive, thorough way. There is nothing that you can add to it. There's nothing you can do to, to heighten it or make it better. All you can do is simply receive what he has done for you. It's a gift. It's not a free gift. It costs Jesus everything. But it's a gift that we receive and admit acknowledge and confess and say, I can't do anything else to come to God other than to receive Jesus and what he's done for me. And what that does, Jesus, who currently, right now, is standing before the Father, it talks about in the scriptures how he makes intercession on our behalf. He is continually presenting himself to the Father. <laughs> he's looking at the Father saying, I've done it. I've done it for him. I've done it for her. I've done it. I've done it, Father. I've done it. He's been doing that for over 2,000 years, day after day, minute after minute. And his desire is for each of us to receive that, to hold on to that, and to not only believe that, but to then walk out in our lives as though it's true, to live in light of, of his sacrifice. How much more then? It is finished. It is done once and for all. You know, one of the things that the gospel reminds us of, I think, is our, our need of assurance of salvation. I can't tell you how many times I have conversations, and I think we need to be reminded of constantly. You know, we... we, we, we we hear the gospel and we think, yeah, I get it. I understand it. Don't let it become old hat for you. You need to be reminded Jesus died for you. He loves you. He forgives you when you entrust your life to him and open yourself to him. And when you receive that, you receive assurance of salvation. Again, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing I could do in order to be right with God but we receive Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and we receive assurance of salvation. Again, Jesus looking at the Father right now saying, I've done it, Father. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. He's done it for you. He's done it for you. He's done it for me. This is the most amazing news that we could ever, ever talk about. I think another thing that the gospel reminds us of is the cost of our salvation. That he died for us. One of the things that, he, that happens when we come to Christ and we will, when we 
receive the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us is that we become that dwelling place for God. We become that place that is prepared. We become that place that is kept ready. We become that place of interior beauty that the Holy Spirit loves to come and make his home in. And, you know, our, 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 our outward, you know, our outwardness might need some working on. But the interior work that Jesus does in us, he says, that's a place that I can make my home. That's a place I can dwell. That's a place I want to be. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are meant to be a dwelling place. We are meant to be a meeting place. We are meant to be a place of encounter, a person of encounter, to be a person who knows the presence of God with us day after day, moment after moment. In order for that to take effect, we need the blood of Jesus applied to our sin. We need our consciences clean and we need to be transformed for the Spirit to come and live within us. And I believe a few things this morning. I believe that the Lord wants to bring assurance to some of us this morning who need it. Maybe you have come to God before. Maybe you've received Jesus before. But, and I'm not saying you need to come to him again and, and as if you need to receive it for the first time. But you need to be reassured that what he's done in your life has taken effect. Some of you need to be reminded of the cost that redemption was. And, and you need to be, again, that painting that I, I showed, you need to rem be reminded of just not to, to focus in on the horrific nature of it and to, to glorify that, but to realize this is his love for you that he went to those lengths. And I believe that some of us need to be invited to open ourselves to be places ready for the Spirit of God to dwell. I'm going to lead us in a prayer here just as we close and as we prepare for communion in a few moments here. And, and as I do so, I'm going to invite you to keep your eyes open. And the reason I want you to keep your eyes open is I want to invite you to keep your eyes on the cross, to look to the cross, to have your eyes open and fixed upon the cross, that we would be drawn into the beauty that his sacrifice brought for us, that you would see a display of divine love that brings rescue and hope and peace with God and healing for your bodies and for your souls. Some of you this morning are going to need to confess your sin to someone today. And I urge you, if the Holy Spirit is bringing something to mind, to not push that away, not push that down, not stuff it away. Deal with it. Some of you need to reaffirm your desire to follow him. Some of you need to give your life to God for the first time. Perhaps you've been watching online or you've been he coming here in person and you have yet to actually say, Jesus, I'm yours. Some of you need to do that. Some of you need to simply gaze upon this instrument of horror that brought us and brings us into eternal life. His forgiveness is available. His love that he gave, or the, his love that he has for you is experiential. You need to gaze upon the cross and to receive that afresh this morning. So I'd like to invite the worship team to come up and invite even the, the prayer team, those of you who are um, on after service prayer, if you could just come up actually right now and just be available at the front as well. If you want to come forward for prayer at any point, whether that's in the coming moments, whether that's during communion, whether that's during the worship or after the service, you're welcome to do that. If you want to turn to someone that you're sitting next to and you want to pray with them, pray for them, receive prayer, you can do that as well. And if you want to sit quietly with the Lord and just allow him to minister to you by his spirit, I invite you to do that now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your cross. We thank you for the assurance of salvation that we have in you. There's nothing we can do. 
only thing we can do is to turn our eyes to you and open ourselves to you and say, you have done it. You've accomplished what no one else could. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Lord, for some of us, we need to, to see the cost of the cross. Lord, you love each and every single one of us so much that you willingly put yourself in that position and died on our behalf. And for that, we give you thanks. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would also bring um, conviction right now where we need conviction. That you would remind us that you don't come to condemn us, but you come to transform us to be more like you. Thank you for your healing, Jesus. And Lord, we just pray that as we enter into a time of communion, that you would be glorified, you'd be honored, that we would be built up and encouraged as we remember your sacrifice for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. This morning, uh, as uh, chair, I get to pray with whoever's preaching. And so I was asking Jonathan this morning, did you plan this, that communion would line up with Hebrews 9? And he said, no, uh, we were going with the end of the month, and <laughs> Hebrews 9 just happened to land, just happened to land on the end of the month. Our God is an awesome God. As we go into uh, the time of communion here, the table is open, or the, the elements are open to all who recognize that you are saved only because of Jesus. A couple of the elders and our ushers are going to help distribute the elements. Uh, I may have to call on one of my prayer guys there. And uh, I ask you to hold on to it. And then when we all have the elements, I'll come back here and I'll, I'll lead us through it, taking the bread and the, the cup. So... Uh, I should mention there is also a gluten-free option in the back. Uh, if you're not sure, just follow Julie. <laughs> They're laughing because Julie isn't here. So don't follow Julie.
we experienced growing pains. We, uh, we were kind of actually, yeah, we had to juggle a few extra plates there. Thank you for being patient with us. God is good. Let me just get organized here. Given that we've been reading in Hebrews, I felt like I wanted to use the Gospel of Matthew, which is um, really kind of written from the Gospel to the to the Jews. By a Matthew, of course, being uh, a Jew, and uh, so I just and it talks about the the covenant. So I'm going to be reading this morning from uh, Matthew 26. I had it on my note here. 26 to 29. This is where Jesus is sharing his last supper, his last meal on earth. And he says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. Let's partake together. And this, as I was reading through, was really where the significance just kind of pulled together. That um, So Jesus took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he offered it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine now until the day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. Let's take this together. Lord, we thank you for the cross. We don't often wrap our heads around how, as Pastor John has said, grotesque it is from a human reality perspective, but it is a beautiful thing, and that, that is how we are made right with you. It is the new covenant, the final sacrifice that was perfect enough. And we celebrate this communion today to remember that sacrifice to remember that you are the only way that we are saved. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 